Hello friends, welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another session on the RBI Grade B series. The agenda of today's session is fairly simple. We basically look at analyzing the finance section of paper 3 of the RBI Grade B phase 2 exam that was conducted recently and try and drive some learnings in terms of what exactly is expected out of you if you're someone who's preparing for the RBI grade B for the next year. So that is the thought process with which this session has been designed. Now, when exactly will the exam happen next year? It's again a question of whether it could be something that could happen in November, December, or maybe something in January, February. It's difficult to predict at this point in time. But at the same time, someone who's serious about RBI for the coming exam obviously has to start the preparation right now so from that perspective where exactly should you be looking to improve what exactly needs to be done as far as finance is concerned those are the kind of things that will be discussed in today's session so without further ado let's jump right in so let us now look at some of the key learnings that can be derived from this year's paper from a finance perspective first things first when i talk about the change in the pattern so anyone who's appearing for the rbi next year needs to understand that there is a fresh pattern that has come in from a finance and management perspective esi perspective also so instead of the 100 marks which was predominantly concentrating on your mcqs until last year this year we had a change in pattern wherein essentially we were looking at a 50 50 kind of a split wherein you're talking about 50 marks allocated towards your objective or your multiple choice questions and again another 50 marks basically focusing on what is basically your descriptive writing skills right so technically again all of this had to be in front of a system so even the descriptive answers had to be typed in on a keyboard and as far as your objective questions were concerned you again had uh, the same scheme of let's say one fourth negative marking for every incorrect answer so all those things were there in terms of the timelines you had half an hour for the initial section for mcqs and then another one and a half hours that was meant for your descriptive writing so now when i get into the nitty gritties of the pattern you're talking about your mcqs which basically had two mark questions how many were there 20 and then when you're talking about your one mark questions there were around 10 questions that were there and then you're talking about your descriptive which obviously had a combination of your 10 marks and 15 mark questions and again you're looking at two 10 mark and 215 marks overall so that is basically the split in terms of your mcqs as well as your descriptive now moving further there was an updated syllabus as well wherein you obviously had some new topics getting added in the context of let's say globalization then you had basically international banking then you had your global financial crisis being added to the syllabus then you also had a specific segment which was until last year a part of multiple things but a specific segment this year got added in the context of fintech as well so there were a lot of changes in the sense that new portions were added to the syllabus and let's say certain portions like your disinvestments were basically omitted from the syllabus this year so from that context obviously some changes happen from a syllabus perspective also now if i look at the paper overall for this year if you are someone who had prepared sincerely for the last let's say eight to nine months and uh, basically looked at various elements of your preparation which we'll discuss in a short while then the level was not that difficult to be honest right especially from a finance perspective if you look at the kind of questions that were there if you are someone who was a serious aspirant and preparing quite hard, you would not have found these questions to be too difficult. So when I say that the paper was relatively easy, what do I mean by that? What kind of questions appeared in the paper? So let's try and understand that aspect as well. So first things first, there were obviously some questions which were definitely purely fact based, which means that you need to know the fact to be able to answer that particular question. Again, you could have looked at the options and eliminated as well. but predominantly these were your fact-based questions the second obviously was a lot of emphasis was on let's say bringing in small caselets and a, let's say a couple of passages small ones and basically linking multiple questions based on that particular passage or paragraph itself so those kind of questions obviously found their presence as far as this year's paper was concerned so your case let or let's say your passage based questions and the third obviously was pure play concept based questions wherein there was a fundamental concept being tested if you understood that concept then application of that concept was a fairly straightforward process and it could have been done so some questions were there from a concept based perspective as well Again, another thing which was missing this year, which has been missing for the last couple of years now, there was no numericals as such present. Well, technically there was one concept based question. You can't necessarily call it a numerical because there was no real calculation involved in that. So again, this year, lack of numericals. What does it indicate? Does it indicate that RBI does not want 
numericals to be added what does that mean it's not something that you cannot say that the numericals will not appear next year they could again very well come back next year but at least they have not found presence in the paper for the last 3 years right so if i start thinking from the perspective of what exactly is the rbi looking for especially based on the finance paper then my observation would be that they're looking for individuals who are generalists who understand concepts who understand the news that they're reading around them and who basically can write reasonably well that's the kind of people that the rbi is essentially looking at now why the sudden emphasis again on descriptive writing why is it so important so when i'm talking about people who are let's say good in terms of fundamentals keep reading a lot of news are aware of what's happening around them and can write well those are the candidates that rbi is looking for now why do i say that on the day when you guys were busy writing the exam that is on april 1st you basically had at least six different circulars or notifications that appeared on the rbi website now obviously it is not by the same person multiple people have been working on multiple reports and let's say if you look at the frequency at which these kind of reports notifications press releases master directions master circulars all of these are coming out on the rbi website you'll realize that there is a lot of work in terms of writing good sensible correct content as well so it's become an integral part of anyone who's basically been working under the rbi right so in that perspective descriptive writing becomes a very very crucial skill for anyone who's looking to become a part of the bigger scheme of things in the reserve bank of india that is where the emphasis is there on descriptive writing but the question that you need to ask yourself is is descriptive writing that difficult honestly it's not right and to that effect again when i discuss the descriptive writing section in the finance paper today you'll realize that these were fairly straightforward questions and all it required was for you to write right if you're someone who are writing continuously sensibly you would be able to crack this section as well right so nothing to be scared of descriptive is not rocket science ki ye nahi ho sakta hai impossible hai aisa kuch bhi nahi hai it's a very very simple straightforward art right and this art also requires some bit of science which obviously i had discussed in a lot of the sessions that we took prior to the exam as well and obviously we'll take a lot of sessions and let's say do a lot of practice for our new batch of students as well but the point is this is not something that is to be scared of this is not something that it can break your chances in the exam it is something which can be very easily developed even if you have not written anything since your class 12th or your college exams कोई बड़ी बात नहीं है आराम से बिल्ड हो सकता है सो डोंट गेट स्केर्ड ऑफ दैट इज वट आई वुड लाइक टू से नाउ दिस इज वॉट इन टर्म्स ऑफ द लेवल ऑफ द पेपर वर्स यू हैड योर फैक्ट बेस्ड क्वेश्चन यू हैड योर केस लेट और योर पैराग्राफ और पैसेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन राइट दर वॉज अ पैसेज एंड सम क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम देर एंड देन यू बेसिकली हैड क्वेश्चन विच वर बेसिकली कॉन्सेप्ट ड्रिवन सो इट वॉज अ मिक्स आई वुड से मोर वेटेज ऑफ योर पैराग्राफ और योर पैसेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन definitely fact based questions were also there conceptual based questions were slightly lesser in number right but there were a lot of fact based questions which did require some bit of let's say knowledge in terms of uh, the concept but at the same time they also required some level of common sense right where you could have solved those questions even if you do not know the answer correctly so from that perspective let's try and understand now as to what is needed to basically ace the finance section क्या चाहिए बॉस इस सेक्शन को क्रैक करने के लिए सो दैट इज व्हाट आई एम गोइंग बी टॉकिंग अबाउट नेक्स्ट फर्स्ट थिंग व्हाट यू नीड टू डेवलप इफ यू डोंट हैव इट ऑलरेडी इज व्हाट इज आई कॉल द सीक्यू व्हाट डू आई मीन बाय सीक्यू सीक्यू रेफर्स टू क्यूरियोसिटी क्वेश्चन राइट सो द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट यू नीड टू ऑफकोर्स डू एज फार एज योर फाइनेंस प्रिपरेशन इज कंसर्न इज दैट इट रिक्वायर्स यू टू डू लोड ऑफ रीडिंग नाउ द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन कम्स इन एज भाई क्या पढ़ू मैं वॉट एक्जैक्टली शुड आई बी रीडिंग सो फर्स्ट थिंग आई शुड लुक एट रीडिंग इज वन फाइनेंशियल डेली एंड वन नेशनल डेली सो वन आई से फाइनेंशियल डेली यू कैन आई दर लुक एट इकोनॉमिक टाइम्स यू कैन बेसिकली लुक एट बिजनेस स्टैंडर्ड यू कैन टॉक अबाउट मिंट पिक अप वन ऑफ दम बट द पॉइंट इज बी रेगुलर राइट एंश्योर दैट यू पिक वन एंड यू बेसिकली कीप रीडिंग एवरी सिंगल आर्टिकल दैट अपियर्स देर वॉट इट विल डू इज दैट इट विल स्टार्ट बिल्डिंग योर क्यूरियोसिटी मोर एंड मोर बिकॉज द फर्स्ट 15 20 days when you read any kind of a newspaper of that type for the first time you'll obviously find it to be extremely challenging there'll be so many terms that you might not know right so that is where your curiosity comes into the picture so if you don't know something what exactly do you do after that agar kuch nahi pata hai mujhe to am i just letting it go or am i spending some time to understand what is it 
right so that is where your curiosity quotient needs to be high so if your curiosity quotient is high it automatically means that if i do not understand something i will make an attempt to understand that is point number 1 right look at a particular article understand what exactly it is talking about give a fillip to your curiosity thinking that okay agar mujhe ye nahi pata hai to main इसको आइडेंटिफाई करके समझने की कोशिश करूंगा या करूंगी दैट इज द होल पॉइंट दैट इज व्हाट क्यूरियोसिटी टॉक्स अबाउट आई विल नॉट लीव एनीथिंग लेट्स से एट द एंड ऑफ द डे आज मान लो मैंने पांच छह आर्टिकल पढ़े हैं बाय द एंड ऑफ द डे आई विल नॉट लेट इट हैपन दैट आउट ऑफ दोज फाइव सिक्स आर्टिकल्स वट आई रेड दे शुडन बी एनीथिंग दैट आई स्टिल डोंट नो right that is what is curiosity quotient if you have a low curiosity quotient what would you do you will just ignore those articles and move forward but if you have a high curiosity quotient you will ensure that you are putting in the right amount of effort to understand whatever has been given in those articles so that's the first step that is required to build that curiosity and that is something which we do in our programs quite often to generate that interest in finance to generate that curiosity in the subject right so that you automatically start reading and automatically start putting in more questions in your mind and when you start answering those questions that are there in your mind that is where your concepts get cleared right so one financial daily and then next thing that i'm talking about is one national daily also because you got to be able to correlate to what the government is doing what is happening from a e governance perspective all of those things become very important as well so that is where you can either look at hindu or any other newspaper that basically is something that you're comfortable with so ensure that you pick up a national daily and a financial daily every single day it has got to become a part of your daily routine so that's going to be crucial so lots of reading and more importantly not just lots of reading but also using curiosity quotient increasing your curiosity quotient to an extent that by the end of any particular day if there are any articles that you've read you should basically know ki tumne us article mein kya padha tha that is what is the most important aspect as far as curiosity quotient is concerned now the next important angle that is required is obviously being the rbi's exam you obviously need to scout the rbi website right there are a lot of circulars there are a lot of new information that gets keep getting posted over there so you need to ensure that you spend enough time on the website as well right you will also get a sense of the kind of writing that comes right there are so many speeches that the rbi governor gives at various locations and deputy governors also give speeches every once in a while so when you look at the rbi speeches also it gives you a good understanding of what's the thought process what exactly is the central bank thinking what kind of policy changes are they looking to make so when you read those kind of speeches automatically your descriptive style of writing also starts improving right and that is obviously a very important part of your overall selection process and again whatever you're doing at this juncture all of this will be extremely important for cracking your interviews as well which forms a major chunk of your selection right so the next thing that's required is the rbi website now apart from that you also need to look at let's say the annual report that the rbi publishes every year you talk about the monetary policy committee report all of those things become important then you talk about the economic survey and you obviously talk about various other uh leading institutions like let's say the IMF or world bank reports and the OECD reports what are they talking about those things kind of also become very very important and every month the RBI also releases let's say two or three articles in their bulletin as well so reading those articles also gives you a lot of valuable information and what do you do with this information is the big question right how do i ensure that all of this information is retained and that is where your note making becomes very very important So if you come across something very good something which can add value ensure that you are taking those notes down somewhere basically it could be anywhere right it just as a repository it could be a tablet it could be a notebook whatever it is but ensure that you keep writing into that notebook because all this information will come extremely handy when you are actually appearing for the exam and at that point of time it will not be possible for you to refer to let's say 10 different scattered sources and gather all the valuable information so that is where retention becomes very important note making becomes very important so whatever you are reading whatever you're capturing through the increased curiosity quotient you need to ensure that it is getting retained also right so it requires regular revision so that is where retention becomes very very important so jab tak aap retain nahi kar pa rahe ho whatever you're reading whatever knowledge that you're gaining all of that 
definitely does not carry any relevance because if you're not retaining you'll not be able to reproduce it in the exam as well right so retention becomes a very very important aspect and now one of the most important skills that obviously i've been talking about it over the last one year as self is basically the fact that common sense prevails right even if you look at the exam this year there were definitely certain questions which if you did not know but you were smart enough to look at the options if you were smart enough to look at the passage the kind of content that was present there you could have still arrived at the answer right so understand one thing that jitna bhi aap pad lo whatever you may read there would still be let's say few questions from here and there that you might probably not remember at the time of the exam ya aap recollect nahi kar pa rahe ho ya fir apne kabhi dekha hi nahi hai so then how do you crack those questions that becomes important right so here is where your common sense comes into the picture your practical application of concepts your practical application of the elimination technique all of these things become very important to crack the exam overall so these are some of the critical skills that are required in order to ace the finance section as far as rbi grade b is concerned of course needless to say that when i talk about the exam to be fairly straightforward and easy it also draws from the fact that majority of the questions were definitely from what we had essentially taught during our sessions we obviously conduct a multitude of variants in terms of different things that we do in our sessions and we'll obviously discuss that with you guys in another subsequent video but the point is that one of the reasons why it also considered to be easy is from the perspective of the paper was easy but obviously a lot of these concepts and techniques that got tested in the exam have been quite holistically covered in our sessions and quite a lot of them have been done in the very initial part of the course itself and quite a few things got happened during the revision stages and the test series as well now moving to another very important aspect before we get into the actual question discussion is what exactly were the major segments from where the questions appeared so let us start off with the objective section and obviously this had four questions that basically appeared from your financial markets so again when i say financial markets it basically includes your capital markets your equity markets and let's say your financial ratios and all of those things all of those things put together you had some four odd questions that were there from financial markets you had four questions technically from e governance now whether you want to call it e governance whether you want to call it changing landscape in the banking sector or basically you want to call it let's say fintech it's up to you but predominantly i would like to call them as e governance because it is improving the governance process with the usage of technology and that is where i would call them as e governance some questions definitely coming in from there as well four questions to be precise now you also had a passage basically which talked about your public private partnership and you had three specific questions coming in from there as well then you basically had three questions that appeared from financial systems basically your financial institutions right and you talk about let's say the percentage of fdi and questions around that as well so a lot of questions around financial systems three to be specific from that perspective and obviously you had one question that came from the budget again and then you had one specific question on fintech wherein i could have not have classified it into anything else but fintech right now these were the set of questions that basically have been picked up from the perspective of memory based feedback given by the students of course right so we don't have the actual paper in front of us so we are analyzing based on the memory of the students who had basically given feedback to us in terms of what kind of questions appeared and these were the predominant heads in which the questions had appeared now when i look at the comparison of this vis a vis the exam that was there last time you obviously had huge number of questions that came in from corporate governance you had huge number of questions that came in from risk management as well so they had significant amount of weightage and then you would start thinking are abhi kya ho gaya where did risk management go where did corporate governance go so the answer to that question is all of those basically moved into the other segment which is basically your descriptive writing wherein you had 115 mark question a huge question on corporate governance 115 mark question a huge question on bessel norms on risk management then you had one question basically on your financial systems wherein we basically talked about your exim sidbi nabard rrb and all of those right so that was a combined question that was there so you had to write short notes on them that was a 15 mark question that was there and then there was one 10 marker on your union budget as well so that is in terms of the overall split as far as the paper is concerned now is this an indication that let's say the segments which got ignored this time there was nothing on globalization there was nothing on international banking there was nothing specifically on derivatives and other important elements as well right so are you saying that these questions will not appear next year 
can't say that right but this was the pattern that was predominantly there this year and these were the segments where the majority number of questions appeared and again a disclaimer here this is again purely memory based and there is a chance that we might not be completely accurate here this is purely based on what our students have communicated to us right but even then it presents a pretty clear picture in terms of where the rbi is going overall right so while you didn't have a descriptive section in the last couple of years the descriptive section that was brought in this year basically ensured that your corporate governance and risk management were also adequately covered as well now if i were to look at the split between finance and management as two separate sections itself there also you'll realize that the weightage of finance in this year's paper was slightly higher than the weightage for management itself in terms of the number of questions that were there and also in terms of the number of descriptive questions that were there right so overall finance seemed to have a slightly higher weightage in the paper as compared to management that again does not signify that next year management will continue to have a lower weightage so it's not an indication of what may happen going forward but it is an indication of course of how the paper was this year right and it also gives you enough fodder in terms of what exactly should be your thought process in terms of preparing for the exam for next year that's the thought process with which you should be working right so this is something which i wanted to share with you guys specifically in terms of what was the learning from let's say the paper itself what kind of questions appeared what kind of topics from where the questions appeared and what was the weightage across topics as well so this is something which i want to discuss before we get into the nitty gritties of the individual two markers one markers and descriptive answers right so now that we have done this let's quickly move to that aspect as well so let us go further deeper into the analysis by looking at the specific questions that appeared in the exam from the perspective of two marks from the perspective of one marks and also the descriptive questions another angle to understand before we get into this is a proper disclaimer right and the disclaimer is that all of this is memory based it is based on what the students have basically told us after having written the exam because there is no official question paper that has been released so a lot of the wordings a lot of the options that are appearing even the value of the marks that are appearing also talking about whether a question was in a single question format or a passage format those things might vary but having said that the intent of the questions pretty much remains the same and uh, we've kind of been able to capture some of the important questions that have come from this perspective right so that's a disclaimer for you that it may not be exactly what the exam was but having said that it's kind of quite essentially capturing all the questions that were there from a finance perspective so from that view point the first question that we're looking at is from a financial markets standpoint so when i say financial markets again you have multiple segments within that you talk about your capital markets again within capital you can talk it in the sense of primary markets and let's say your secondary markets and then you have again within the context of capital you could probably look at your equity markets and your debt markets as well then you're talking about your uh, money markets that are there right so so many other markets essentially can actually emerge from this discussion itself and again you can talk about your over the counter market at the same time you have your exchange traded market so there are multiple types within the space of financial markets itself but this question was basically pertaining to capital markets right so it's sort of a small passage on capital markets right so one of them was which of the following is true and it basically said is sebi the regulator of the capital markets which we know for sure that it is the second option was sebi is the regulator of commodity markets obviously you had something called as an fmc or a forward markets commission that got merged with sebi as well and that is something which we had discussed in our sessions on financial markets and regulators so it's been covered and then the third option given was that rbi is the regulator of your non banking financial companies so this is again quite explicit in obviously various discussions that we've had and of course the session that we conducted on youtube as well in terms of nbfc tiering so obviously it's a no brainer that rbi is definitely the regulator of your nbfcs as well so it was a fairly straightforward question and the answer to this question was obviously all of these right so moving on to the next question in this space which basically again was on the same passage and it basically talked about a circular that was released by sebi in 2018 and basically talked about the applicants can also apply for an initial public offering through which of these modes so essentially when you talk about 2018 that's when your upi from a perspective of your initial public offerings and let's say as a mode or a means to basically apply for ipos was coming up big time at that stage right so which is where 
the answer to this question based on whatever options were given were obviously some of the options given there were obviously your NEFT you also had your national automated clearing house so all these were there right but UPI fitted the bill perfectly now NEFT is something which is been there for quite some time so it was not something that came recently then NACH is more similar to the context of your electronic clearing system or your ECS which basically looks at a mandate based transaction right so for example you talk about your uh, monthly installment payments and stuff like that that would basically fall under the purview of NACH but an IPO is probably a one time process wherein the amount basically gets deducted from your account and happens through obviously another methodology called as ASBA which we'll be discussing in the next question but predominantly based on the options given in this question it was fairly evident that the answer to this one was of course your UPI right and that was a fairly straightforward question again right now moving on to the next question which basically talked about again ASBA and talks about the ASBA applications can be made through what now for those of you who don't understand ASBA it basically is an applications supported by blocked amount so what it essentially means is that whenever you make an IPO application that application supported is basically having something called as a blocked amount wherein whatever was the amount for which you had applied in the IPO that amount will basically get blocked into your respective account right and this is to ensure that whatever authorization is required from the perspective of the application money right all of that remains intact and it also ensures that let's say in case you had applied for 10 but you got allocated only 8 shares the remaining will basically be unblocked so let's say 8 will be taken up the money pertaining to the remaining 2 will continue remaining in your account and the only thing that will happen is that the money for the remaining two will become unblocked so what it means is that it obviously streamlines your collection process and it also reduces the time between let's say an application getting rejected and the money coming back into your account so all of those were benefits of ASBA and so obviously it made a lot of sense now the important aspect here was this process to be facilitated for your retail individual investors obviously had an additional option through which you could do this so they could basically apply through something called as an SCSB which is your self certified syndicate bank so that's the answer in this case right so all your retail investors can basically have bank accounts with these self certified syndicate banks right and obviously these banks obviously need to satisfy certain conditions and criteria that have been laid down by SEBI and your uh, SESBs would accept the applications verify the applications and basically block the fund to the extent of the payment that is there in the bid right and also upload the details in the web based bidding system of the national stock exchange or BSE whatever it is right and once basically the allotment is happening then uh, the unblock will happen depending on what is the scenario right if there is any amount to be returned that amount will get unblocked and let's say if every amount that has been bid is basically going to get subscribed then all of that amount will move into the clearing account so that's the overall context right so from that perspective the answer to this question is obviously your self-certified syndicate banks but I thought it's better for you to also understand what ASBA is all about and we obviously had discussed this with our students in one of our doubt clearing sessions as well so this is quite extensively covered in the program as well so if you look at this answer it basically talks about your self-certified syndicate bank so that's the answer to this particular question now moving to another passage that basically appeared now it's difficult to basically look at a specific categorization there I would prefer to categorize that in the context of e-governance you can also look at it categorization as let's say a fintech question but predominantly it is e-governance because it is ensuring that governance happens through a more streamlined methodology with the use of technology right that's the reason why I would prefer to classify this set of questions under e-governance so there was basically a passage on your e-toll collection right and uh, or basically electronic toll collection and the question was the paragraph is specifically talking about dash platform and basically the collection happens through dash account right so now there are two contexts to this particular question so one aspect that you can look at it is you can think of it as current affairs right and this is something that uh, e-toll collection and fast tag has become definitely a must as far as India is concerned and a lot of uh, people who are buying cars need to have that available all your toll collection happens through that only so the point is 
you can look at it from a current affairs perspective wherein fast tag and e toll collection has been in the news quite extensively over the last couple of months so that could be one of the reasons why this question has come the second angle to look at would be that there was a notification that was released by the RBI in december 2019 which basically talked about enhancing facilitation of your national electronic toll collection or your netc and which quite extensively discussed about fast tag as well right so this is something which can be linked in two ways so one it is definitely there on the rbi website as a notification and plus it's also there as a critical element of current affairs in the last couple of months so if you've been reading newspapers regularly you have definitely come across this particular news so from that context this answer obviously becomes fairly straightforward so the platform that basically you're looking at is your netc Right, you're talking about your national e-toll collection, and the collection basically happens through your fast tag account, and which is basically an RFID-based account, and your amount automatically gets deducted when, let's say, the sensors detect the RFID from your car and uh, basically match it with your details. Right, so that's the process overall. So definitely, I think this should be categorized as e-governance more than fintech because it is definitely ensuring a faster collection process for the government as well. right so technically it can be part of fintech as well but i would prefer to categorize it as e governance so the next question on this same theme was basically on again e toll collection itself and it basically talked about which body introduced e toll collection so the answer to this one of course was your national payments corporation of india or npci and we had obviously covered this in uh, our sessions which we call it as your one scheme a day or osad so this was basically covered in one of the osads as well and uh, if you look at let's say some of the critical elements that are present from an india stack perspective right in terms of let's say important apis that are there there you obviously have things like your aadhar authentication and then your aadhar kyc both these are pretty important elements here then you basically talk about the e sign which is again a very important part of the india stack then you have your digi locker which is also quite important then you obviously have your upi or your unified payments interface and so there were other elements that were also there apart from these which also have very strong apis and are basically society related platforms which have been built on similar principles as compared to the india stack so which are these platforms right so from that perspective when i look at it you talk about your gstn which is your goods and services tax network then you talk about your bbps which is your bharat bill payment systems and then you talk about your netc which is your national e or electronic toll collection under the brand name of fast tag so these are some of the important components of the india stack right and uh, based on let's say similar kind of principles so this is something which we discussed in our sessions as well so this is again something that has come from there only right so moving further we book at the next set of questions which arrived in the context of your public private partnership or your triple p which is also there as part of the syllabus so here there was a passage on your triple p and infrastructure and there were some questions based on that so the first one was obviously talking about the model that was specifically being described in the passage now based on what the students have told us i think it was fairly evident from the passage itself wherein the words hybrid as well as annuity were mentioned in different locations so you could pretty easily figure out that the model that they were basically talking about was the hybrid annuity model so this question in itself was a fairly no brainer and all you required was presence of mind and read the passage carefully you would have figured out the answer from there the next question essentially was around something which you would obviously need to know to be able to figure out so again this was something which we had discussed in our sessions that we conducted for triple p as well and we were specifically discussing about the hybrid annuity model so the question here was as per the model support provided by the government during the construction phase and later in the annuities during the operational phase will be in the ratio of what so that was a question that was specifically put forward now to get a good understanding of ham or your hybrid annuity model it is basically a combination of two models which work together which is basically one your bot annuity when i say bot it refers to build operate and transfer and the second one which you're talking about is your epc model which is like a turnkey project model which basically looks at elements of your engineering procurement and your construction so combining these two models is what what basically calls your hybrid annuity model right and obviously this was a model that was announced by the government in early 2016 
right and uh, in terms of the project costs that is shared by the government and the private player uh, in terms of the construction phase and the operational phase as well it is basically looked at from a perspective of 40 to 60 as the ratio so that was the answer so of course this is a fairly straightforward question again if you've actually understood what ham as a model is all about and this is again something which we had discussed in our session so the answer in this case was your 40 to 60 now moving forward to the next question here which again requires some bit of presence of mind to solve and you'll realize it when i actually put the question on the screen for you guys so here again the question was the highest public private partnership is found to be in which sector right so when i say a public private partnership it's a combination of public and the private entities coming together and working on a project now it was fairly evident that these were the options given now when i talk about banking you talk about pure play public sector banks then you have the concept of your private banks you may have also other kinds of banks there in the terms of small finance banks you may have your payments banks all of these are there but none of these technically can be classified as a combination of private and public. So if you had applied some bit of logic, you would know that it cannot be the answer. Then again, from a telecom space, you have very specific players like your MTNL and BSNL, which are pure play, public sector. And then you have players like Airtel, Vodafone and the like. So you basically know that all of these are more from private perspective. Right? So again, there are no combinations here as well. So if you look at from a overall thought process perspective and applying a bit of common sense you could have arrived at the decision that it has to be infrastructure only which has the major number of projects which basically work on a combination of public as well as private as a combined group so you would have definitely figured out that the answer was infrastructure if you basically had looked at it from a practical standpoint and let's say thought about the question and applied a bit of common sense you should definitely be able to arrive at this particular answer right so these were the questions on triple p and infrastructure moving to the next set which was basically talking about your financial systems and the question was which of the following are depositories again a fairly straightforward question in itself the options were given to you as NSDL, your stock exchange India Limited, you talked about CCIL which is a clearing and settlement house and then you had CDSL. So obviously the answer in this case was fairly straightforward. You had to look at your NSDL and your CDSL. So again a fairly straightforward question wherein the answer was your National Securities Depository Limited and your Central Depository Services Limited and that was the answer to this one. Right. So moving on to the next question that was there, it essentially talked about name of the payment regulator that was set up under the payments and settlements act 2007 so this was again something which we had discussed in our sessions and we basically call it as your value adds and revision as well and this was part of the initial discussion in uh, financial systems as well so we had covered that there so you're talking about which was the entity or let's say the regulator set up under psa 2007 even if you did not know or understood the concepts fairly clearly when you talk about the payments and settlements act one of the biggest entities that got established around that time was basically your national payments corporation of india and that was the answer to this question it was a fairly straightforward answer overall so if you're someone who's basically tracking news or let's say were thorough in your preparation overall you should have been able to answer this question as well so now moving on to the next question essentially again from the context of e-governance and this was an interesting twist that was brought out by the rbi wherein this time they basically combined questions from a management and finance perspective as well. So this was basically a question that was there around your language translation and it talked about one question on barriers to communication that was more from a management perspective. So there's a good interlinkage that was brought out by the RBI here, right? So, and this was something which we had again uh, discussed when we talked about the mission mode projects and the various initiatives that the government was basically undertaking from a language perspective, right? So again, the question was basically testing you on several perspectives. So one of the things it was asking is that this is a portal launched by the government to overcome the barriers in communication in local languages. Based on the given options that were there, you could have again narrowed down or eliminated various things. And you would also figure out that when you're talking about tech and electronic space, the answer should probably have some element of E over there. And that is where your E Aksharayan basically became the answer to this particular question. Now, when you look at the overall scheme in terms of what the government was doing in terms of the mission mode projects, they had launched another initiative even before E Aksharayan, which was basically known as your E Bhasha, which was again meant towards 
spreading your digital content in many local languages on the other hand when you talk about your e akshara n it was more an optical character recognition engine for your indian languages wherein your let's say picking up scanned images and let's say converted them into digitized form was something that e akshara n basically specialized in so in that context obviously e bhasha was already there e akshara n was more from the context of again overcoming the barriers of communication in terms of language translation right so that is the whole idea or the concept behind this and based the options given this was a fairly easy guess from that perspective as well even if you did not know the actual answer right now the next level to this basically was the question which basically said what is the name of the mission that was launched for translation of the languages it's again self evident in the name itself and the answer was of course your national language translation mission right so that is something which was established right and uh, again a couple of questions more from the e governance perspective moving further the next question obviously was from the perspective of pure play fintech so now technically while you can still classify your e governance questions as fintech or let's say changing landscape in banking sector but it's better to classify them as e governance more from the perspective of the fact that they are making governance a lot easier right now the question that i'm talking about now it was a pure play fintech question you could not have classified it anywhere else so here the question was on regulatory sandbox and this was something which we had quite extensively discussed in a lot of our sessions as well and this was part of our test series as well and uh, this was basically a question which talked about rbi has released the second dash with the theme cross border payments under the dash for live testing of new products or services in a controlled regulatory environment now even if rbi had actually asked your cross border payments as a blank i would have still been quite happy in terms of the question because then it's at least testing you on your understanding of fintech right so when you talk about the different stages that we've had so far as far as your regulatory sandbox is concerned and obviously the name for your stages is basically known as your cohorts so you basically started off with the first cohort that was based on your retail payments and then you had the second cohort which was based on your cross border payments and a third cohort has also been announced which is basically based on your msme lending now the question is that if they had asked you the specifics of which cohort was launched when i would have still been happy that okay this was a slightly more difficult question but this turned out to be quite straightforward because the options were also such that it clearly defined what you're talking about so you're talking about the second cohort and then it basically was talking about under the regulatory sandbox right for live testing so they made the question even more simpler than what it could have ideally been so from that perspective i think the students basically were better prepared to answer this one right and this was a fairly straightforward blank that had to be filled and the answer in this case was your cohort and your regulatory sandbox again a straightforward question for you to solve and attempt okay let us now quickly move to the one mark questions right so you're talking about a question that appeared on the union budget and again quite extensively discussed in our sessions as well so you talked about which of the following is basically part of your revenue expenditure right so when i talk about revenue expenditure it basically talks about that part of your government expenditure right and which will basically does not result in any kind of creation of assets right that's the whole context here that's what is the meaning of your revenue expenditure so any expenditure by the government which does not result in the creation of assets is basically classified as your revenue expenditure so in that context again even if you did not know the answer you could have basically thought about it and think about it that your interest payments and your subsidies technically do not result in the creation of an asset in themselves right so technically when you talk about any kind of loans now i'm not sure about the terminology of this one whether it was government loans or loans to government it still needs to be clarified but of course it will definitely lead to let's say some elements of asset creation itself so overall when you're talking about things like payments of your salaries your wages your pension subsidies interest payments all of these are basically part of your revenue expenditure so it was a fairly straightforward answer in that context right so moving on to the next question that was there from a one marker standpoint you basically had two companies that were basically provided and both of them had respective share prices of 1800 and 600 now they were said to have the same number of shares the same face value same dividend payments same earnings now which of the following is true was was being asked now technically it said that a will need a higher capital adequacy ratio than b and then the second one was your a's company has higher price to earnings than b's right so these were the 
couple of options that were there and of course there were other options also there now when i talk about a capital adequacy ratio it is more relevant in the context of your financial entities and institutions might not be necessarily relevant in the context of companies right so there obviously your liquidity ratios matter more and that becomes more important in that sense right so here it was a straightforward calculation wherein you talk about your pe ratio or your price to earnings ratio as basically the market price divided by your earnings per share now the context here is fairly straightforward and since your eps is same in both the cases because you're talking about the same earnings so obviously the same earnings would be there per share also right because the number of shares is also the same so as a result since both of them have the same eps the higher pe will be for the entity which has a higher price so obviously since a had a higher price the pe obviously for a turned out to be higher and that was the answer that had to be marked so again a fairly straightforward conceptual question i mean not too much practical application required if you knew the basics you could have again answered this fairly easily so that was the answer in this case moving on to the next question basically this was on financial systems and talked about the maximum fdi limit that was there under government approved route in your public sector banks then again talking in the context of your maximum permissible fdi in your private banks and the maximum holding limit by a single entity as well so all these three put together when you're talking about your public sector banks the maximum limit is basically at 20% then when you talk about your private banks it basically is at 74% and then maximum holding by a single entity in a bank is at 10%. So again this was there in the news quite recently in the last few months and again became relevant in that context. So the answer in this case was basically your 20, 74 and 10 and in the given options again there were so many variations that this was quite easily the option that you could pick up. And this question basically had two of these things specifically getting tested in one of our questions in the test series as well wherein we'd be specifically asked as to what is the limit for your public sector as well as your private sector banks so if you'd undertaken the test series also you would have been able to solve this particular question fairly easily now moving forward to the other critical segment of this paper which was your descriptive section now again it was split into your 15 marks and your 10 mark questions now if i were to basically pinpoint as to how the descriptive this time was then i would say that since this was the first year in which descriptive was relaunched it was a fairly straightforward set of questions that were there now all of these questions were obviously there in our list of predicted questions that we had basically shared with our students and more specifically when you look at some of these questions uh, these were not so complicated that it required any rocket science knowledge at all so the first one in the 15 marks was basically talking about what is corporate governance what is its needs and what are the key principles of corporate governance quite extensively covered in our first lecture on corporate governance itself now if you wanted additional points that you would want to add in this then obviously you could have referred to the session that i took on corporate governance in banks which was just let's say a week prior to the actual exam so that would also given you a lot of pointers to this particular question again a fairly straightforward question and should have been easily attempted the next thing was talking about the basel norms and obviously explaining the major pillars of basel norms also again a fairly fairly straightforward question so while this was on corporate governance this question was essentially from a risk management standpoint again a fairly straightforward question now to the extent that this was a question which was completely discussed as far as one of my earlier youtube sessions was also there and uh, the complete answer was basically given to this question itself and the same question appeared in the exam again so again from that context this was also fully covered and expect that all of you would have written the answer to this one as well now moving on to the next question the roles and functions of nabard this is something which is again quite extensively covered as far as your financial systems are concerned and we talk about your financial institutions your nabard nhb your regional rural bank sitb exim all of them are covered quite extensively there so again quite a sitter question because all you had to do was write worth 3 marks on each of these and this was definitely something which was doable as well right the next important question that basically appeared from a 10 mark standpoint was again a no brainer wherein it asked you to talk about the five important announcements of the union budget 2021 so again something which we had covered quite extensively when we were discussing the union budget itself right so nothing that can be called as unexpected as far as a descriptive paper was concerned it was definitely quite extensively fact based and second it was obviously quite extensively 
direct as well so nothing indirect here fairly straightforward straight questions that were asked all it required was a proper structure in your answer a good management in terms of content your introduction and your conclusion with let's say the ideal kind of points being mentioned if you've done that you would have probably ensured good marks coming out of this segment as well so i hope you enjoyed today's session wherein obviously we took you through a detailed analysis of the overall finance paper as far as this year's rbi grade b phase 2 exam was concerned key takeaways from this if any firstly paper was fairly straightforward and easy anyone who had put in significant amount of effort for the last one year should have been easily able to crack this section third descriptive writing is not as complicated or as difficult as you guys think all it requires is sincere efforts and under the right kind of guidance you can crack that as well so not something which is too complicated or difficult to master at all so those are the critical takeaways that i wanted to leave you with the other important aspect is that keeping in mind there are a lot of queries that most of you have reached out to us with in terms of our own launch of the new course and various other elements as well so we have been working relentlessly in coming up with a comprehensive offering for all of you guys so from that perspective when you go to our youtube channel and look at the communities tab there is one specific poll that has been launched for all of you guys so what i would earnestly request each and every one of you who is serious about rbi grade b preparation to go and submit your answers to that poll because we want to take your inputs before we come up with our offering right so that is something which we are conscious about doing to take your inputs seriously and ensure that we come up with something that is exciting for you guys something that can ensure that you ace this exam and reach to the rbi grade b so that's the objective with which we are doing everything that is there pertaining to this particular course so please ensure that you go to our youtube channel go to the community tab and fill that particular poll your opinion means a lot to us and our course offering this year would obviously depend heavily on what you guys tell us right so that's the inclusive approach that merit shine has So on that note this is Ravi signing off and I look forward to continuously engaging with you over the next year as well and ensure that we crack the RBI grade B together. Have a great day and a wonderful wonderful week ahead. See you guys.